and thus acknowledge and honor the racial and gender diversity of our nation's music culture. In fall 2020, members of that group, now calling itself Emerge, published a colloquy in Jams, Shadow Culture Narratives, Race, Gender, and American Music Historiography, and Josephine Wright was one of the contributing authors. This past June, 2023, Dr. Krista Craven, Dean of the Faculty and Professor of Anthropology, Sociology, and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the College of Worcester, where Josephine taught for 40 years, referred to Dr. Wright's colloquy article as, quote, a career crowning achievement, end quote. If you don't need to know this work, read it. It's a gem. Dr. Wright combed through documents related to the Civil War press corps to unearth an eyewitness account by a young white correspondent from Philadelphia that appeared in the New York Times. Kane O'Donnell wrote about watching Southern slaves dance at a wedding. As Dr. Wright explained, my optic as a historian is to provide a documented narrative of the transition of black people and their culture during the Civil War and up until the passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments. It's an important period that historians don't cover very well. They cover the battles, but what they forget, these papers are rich in genealogy, in battle history, but also rich in terms of people. And we are all richer because of the work and person of Dr. Joseph E. Wright. Each panelist today will speak about some aspect of Dr. Wright's legacy, and then we invite Dr. Wright to say a few words if she would like. Finally, if we have time, we invite audience members to chime in and contribute to our honoring chorus. There is one change among our panelists. Dr. Matthew Morrison, who was going to be with us, couldn't get to the airport in time, missed his flight, and so Dr. Samantha Egan is going to read his um, remarks. We're going to start with Mark Burford, then go to Horace Maxiel and Christine Turner, Samantha Egan, and Lassie Milby. So, Mark, please take Wright's contributions to musicological and black historical scholarship have been broad, deep, and profound. She was born in Detroit and raised in Kansas City, and perhaps like many of us, she found her way to musicology almost accidentally. Her father, an Episcopal priest, was an organist, and she learned to play that instrument, along with piano and violin. But her true love was singing. She studied voice in Munich and in Florence, and while in the latter city, she met a scholar of Florentine carnival songs despite having no idea what musicology was, and she saw what kind of work he was doing and thought to herself, I can do that. Wright returned to the United States and wrote her master's thesis at the University of Missouri at Columbia on an expressionist composer that even she can't remember the name of. <laughs> but she eventually entered the PhD program at New York University, as she described as finishing school, where she was mentored by Victor Yellen, Martin Bernstein, and Jan Leroux. Wright wrote her dissertation on the secular cantatas of Neapolitan composer Francesco Mancini, fully, fully intending to be a scholar of the Italian Baroque. That is, until the group, fond of making connections, introduced her to Harvard professor Eileen Southern, the preeminent scholar of black music. It was a life-changing encounter. Advising Wright of a likely dead end for a black scholar of white European repertory, the skepticism still faced by black musicologists today, Southern extended a straightforward and ambitious invitation. Help me build the source materials in the field of black music scholarship, Southern told her. Wright accepted the challenge, and Southern became what Wright describes as a mentor for life, who inspired her to reinvent herself as a scholar of black music. Wright's scholarship, pioneering in its own right, has explored several distinct areas of inquiry. Among these is a body of studies of black classical musicians in perhaps reflecting her background as a violinist. Between 1979 and 1990, Wright authored a series of articles on the careers of violinist George Bridgetower in the 18th and 18th century England, Cuban violinist Jose White, Jose White in 19th century Paris, and the Afro-Cuban Jimenez Trio, a family chamber ensemble that toured Europe in the 1870s. Wright also produced important work on black British composer Ignatius Sancho, including a fact 
facsimile of, co of collected editions of Sancho's music. Her work on these figures was innovative for, innovative for how it attri attributed the significance of amateur and professional black musicians, not to their status as anomalies, but to the ways in which they were unexpectedly integrated participants in the concert life of their respective localities. Wright's 1984 article, Black Women in Classical Music, published in Women's Studies Quarterly, documented the careers of a transatlantic cohort of women, including Ciceretta Jones, Maria Saliga Williams, and Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, while also reminding us that these women represented just the tip of the iceberg of, in her words, what promises to become a fertile field of inquiry in Black Women's Studies. In the 1992 Beshrift that she edited in Southern's honor, Wright contributed an article on black women in classical music in late 19th century Boston, which continued her exploration of an under-recognized black presence in concert life. The fest shirt was a testament to Wright's extended partnership with Southern, which over the years produced the indispensable co-edited volumes, African American Traditions and Songs, Sermon, Tale, and Dance, and Images, Iconography of Music in African American Culture, 1770s to 1920s. A standout feature of Wright's scholarship is her virtuosic research, drawing on previously unexamined sources, and she followed Southern's lead in illuminating for scholars to come methodological approaches to the study of black music, particularly in her 1990 bibliographic guide to periodical literature for black music research, and her 2000 article, Coming of Age, Reflections on Black Music Scholarship. Wright had notably important relationships with two academic journals, American Music, which she edited from 1994 to 1997, and Black Perspective in Music, a path-breaking journal in which she published pieces in the 70s and 80s on a range of subjects, including two in 1976, on the singer and impresario Orpheus McAdoo, and a conversation with jazz trumpeter Izzy Gillespie. During the 1980s, Wright compiled listings of new music by Black composers from Black Perspective an extraordinary catalog of the latest repertoire by such composers as Adolphus Hillstorm, James Berman, Dorothy Red Moore, Betty Jackson King, T.J. Anderson, Leslie Adams, and many others. These new music listings of BPM are an invaluable and surely underutilized resource for present-day performers and programmers. And as indicated by her recent contribution to the 2020 Bridge Colloquy and Jams, mentioned by Denise, the U.S. late music in the lens of the Civil War festival. So, Professor Wright, today we thank you and we honor you for an extraordinary legacy of exemplary, real, redefining scholarly production whose rewards are as inspirational as they have been. documents that black people have been part of classical music for hundreds of years. Dr. Wright's work is particularly helpful for teachers because her meticulous scholarship answers the sorts of questions that students are likely to have, and she places her subjects within the context of the musical culture of their time, as well as in art music more broadly, which is just what we need for the classroom. I urge all of you to look at her work, as well as those of other um, scholars like her who were active from the 1960s into the early 2000s. The kind of basic biographical and bibliographic work that she 
Eileen Southern, Dominique DeLorma, and others did in this period is incredibly helpful in the classroom and frankly is often not undertaken by scholars today. Dr. Wright's work is vital because it gives scholars and students a solid base to build upon for the future. Today, Horace and I will use Dr. Wright's 1990 article in the Black Music Research Journal, Violinist Jose White in Paris, 1855 to 1875, to introduce two different kinds of lessons that might be useful to you in your classrooms. These will be brief, but we hope they will give you, uh, those of you who work with students ideas for the future. As Dr. Wright explains, White was an Afro-Cuban concert violinist in the second half of the 19th century and was particularly well known for his interpretation of French and German repertoire. As so often happens with performers from marginalized communities, he can be treated as a first with no other explanation. In this case, his historic debut with the Philharmonic Society of New York during the 1875-76 season. This is the first thing to emphasize to students. Too often, people like White can be framed as an exceptional figure who seems to bubble up for a concert and then disappears. But of course, this is never true. Instead, White has a very long career in Paris. Born, in December born on December 31st, 1835 in Cuba, White received his early training there and after encouragement from Louis Moro Gottschalk, went to Paris for further training in 1855. Gottschalk helped raise money to fund White's journey in education. This is another aspect to emphasize to students. Musicians don't appear out of nowhere. They require a community of people to help them, even the great men that we usually study in survey classes. Dr. Wright's article goes on to detail White's time at the Paris Conservatory, his repertory, and the groups he played with in Paris, all of which demonstrates White's musical skills, the community that nurtured him, and how he fit within Paris's musical and cultural scene. One of the most helpful aspects of Dr. Wright's article for instructors is her documentation of White's network of contacts and supporters. This is not even all of them. I just tried to fit as many as I could on this, uh, on this slide from as many different aspects as I could. Teachers can use this scholarship to help students understand how the Paris music scene worked and compare it to scenes the students might be more familiar with, such as the scene in your college music department, the town in which you live, or a popular music scene. Because White was involved with many canonic figures from this period, teachers can also continue to show how the lone genius is just a myth. White is also a good example to show the life of a typical musician of this period. He was a composer, violin teacher, working chamber music, musician, solo performer, and a founding member of several chamber ensembles, including the Societe Schumann, which was very important in bringing that composer's music to the Parisian audience. White's career looks a lot like one that many of our students might have today. He was a real entrepreneur as he managed a career that utilized all of his musical skills. His example can serve as an inspiration, especially to students of color who might feel that classical music is not welcoming to them. Finally, oops, sorry. Um, Dr. Wright provides an appendix with both White's compositions and his solo and chamber concert repertory. Students might recognize some, but certainly not all of the pieces he played. This list would provide a great starting point to talk about the development of the canon and how much more varied the repertory that 19th century musicians actually played is than what we play from the 19th century today. Instructors might compare some of the pieces White performed and composed with canonic repertory, assign students new repertoire to listen to and report back to the class about, or to design a concert using White's repertoire as a starting point. Now I'm going to turn this over to Horace. In taking a closer look at White's composition and addressing my impulses for analysis and note crunching, I must admit to being lured to the six etudes by Dr. Wright. While working through the bibliography for our book, I took another look at Dr. Wright's article on White's years in Paris. As a theorist who's interested in the music of black composers, her comments on the six A2 both dared me to take a deeper dive and also shamed me for not having dived in earlier. The invitation was appealing, as Dr. Wright found the blues to be, quote, the most exciting, end quote, among all of the works that White had published or that were in print at the time that she published the article. My 
to be there. Let me pull back. <laughs> she continued, quote, collectively these etudes are striking for their melodic content as well as their technical difficulty, and they give insight into the technical skills of their creator, end quote. So I accepted Dr. Wright's invitation and took a few notes on some pieces, but one etude truly stuck out because of its pedagogical promise in music theory and music history classrooms. While I have not had the opportunity to fully engage the historical queries and points of departure, there are some interesting harmonic nuggets in the sixth etude that have made their way into some of my advanced harmony classes. I'll draw attention to a few. First, the sixth etude is dedicated to his friend, Arango of Havana. Arango was, is only one of two friends mentioned as such in White's dedication <clears throat> to the violin virtuosos in the collection. Yvette Oyachiev states that Arango was a violinist and organist of African descent and was also a teacher and composer of religious music who served churches in Havana. It is possible that White and Arango collaborated, but there is not much that documents the extent of their relationship. In making stylistic comparisons to contradances by Cuban composers, Oyachiev suggests that some of White's, quote, harmonic cadences are characteristic of 19th century um, Cuban music, end quote. While intrigued, I am not familiar enough with 19th century Cuban music to agree or disagree with this notion. However, the sixth prelude has some compelling harmonic features that bridge convention and surprise on local and global levels. At the macro level, the piece is in G major with thematic returns that hint toward a large scale form of exposition, contrast, and re-exposition. White's jaunts to the subtonic and minor dominant with the primary thematic material proved to be more than episodic interpolations, but slightly less than moments that alter the overall large scale design. Indeed, a move to D minor is followed by a move to D major in a contrasting section that ultimately establishes the structure of return to the main idea in G major. Unfortunately, we can't see all of that right now, but there is a good chunk of G major here on the screen. Time will not permit a thorough unpacking of the form and modal jaunts, but I, like Dr. Wright, suggest that you give this collection, and this A2 specifically, a serious look. I'd like to look at a couple of harmonic features. One, a harmonic sequence, and two, a really interesting A sharp. Let's look at this uh, harmonic sequence. We'll note the articulations of A, G, F, E flat, and D major chords on the strong halves of the beats. Whereas the A major chord could be explained as a secondary function, the F and E flat chords point to a more uh, type of use of modal mixture. The ultimate goal is D, which is functioning at a G, uh, which is functioning as five of G at this moment. As this particular sequence occurs in the third measure of the piece, White may have well have been foreshadowing the large scale play with mode that occurs throughout the entire etude. In fact, the same harmonic gesture occurs in the keys of D major and F major over the course of the piece. Another little interesting feature is White's use of an A sharp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is set against A natural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the low A sharp ultimately resolves to B in the next measure. You can see that, right? And it appears that this transient visit to B minor is prepared by a really striking treatment of this A sharp. In my world, I wish that there was a higher A sharp so it could have really been a wicked, wicked, wicked augmented six chord. That didn't happen. Oh, how I wish that the A-sharp could have been coupled with a C-sharp at the first 16th note so that we could have had some kind of secondary function leading us to B minor. That didn't happen. Ultimately, this A-sharp looks forward while the A minor stuff in the first two beats actually look backward to the A minor that we occurred before, which is a very interesting technique. And if we are able to listen to a recording of it, the violinist Rachel Barton Pine seriously leans into that A sharp so that we are able to hear the structural beat. In closing, and in thinking through considerations for discussion in the music history classroom, how might we invoke 
the locations and locales in which White may have interacted with his friend Barranco. What did church music sound like in Cuba during those years? Could some of White's harmonic and chromatic adventures have been inspired by uh, improvisations that Arango played in church? Furthermore, if Cuban harmonic emblems are as evident as this particular scholar Boyachev suggests, I'm encouraged by the thought of rich discussions that could emerge from White's subtle fusions of Cuban musical practice into etudes that were played by French violin students in the 19th century. After all, and because of Dr. Wright's work, we know these etudes were favored by the faculty at the Paris Conservatory. In light of all points of departure that Kristen and I have thought through, and even for points of deeper dives into the things that I've mentioned today, I want to say thank you, Dr. Wright, for the heads up. <laughs> I can just listen to a little bit of it.
In our current scholarly climate, there are certain approaches within monographs that seem to be more common and or preferred as refle reflected by the publication lists of most major presses. Books like my own, Black Sound, that espouse the development of a new theory are sometimes valued over ones that might take a more traditionally historical approach to studying a specific subject, although, to be sure, my work itself is also historical. Even further, the idea of compiling invaluable bibliographic resources, such as the ones I'm focusing on for this vet of Professor Wright, seems to be mostly out of vogue in our current landscape. While there is a wealth of bibliographies compiled and shared across social media, the tradition of the deeply researched, annotated bibliographies and source materials published in print by Josephine Wright, as well as Eileen Southern and Dominique René de Lerma from Greenwood Press's Encyclopedia of Black Music, has largely escaped us. But as the title of my talk, Josephine Wright and the Architecture of Black American Music Studies, suggests, Without these foundational works, the research that I and many of us pursue on black music across, across genres would be thin. Specifically, I want to call attention to Wright and Southern's monumental volume, African American Traditions in Song, Sermon, Tale, and Dance, 1600 to 1920, an annotated bibliography of literature, collections, and artworks, published by Greenwood Press in 1990. This 365 page eight by 10 hardbound publication is dizzying. It isn't dizzying because it is not clear. The volume is executed and organized with the highest efficiency. It is dizzying because when I begin to fathom the number of hours that it took to compile, organize, assess, annotate, and edit two and a half centuries of materials on black American music from a battery of difficult to find sources, I am in awe of the dedication, time, and energy that it must have taken to devote to this meticulous and often thankless work. Work that has allowed for the continued study of black music, a field that has become one of the most central areas of study and interest in music departments today, despite the challenges that black faculty and graduate students continue to face within music disciplines. In the unapologetic spirit of Professor Wright, I have written an essay in American music in honor of Dr. Ramsey, alongside an essay by Dr. Samantha Ege that addresses this concern. This remarkable encyclopedic volume breaks down a wealth of materials compiled by Wright and Southern into five parts. The colonial federalist era, the antebellum era, the post-emancipation era, the WPA slave narrative collection, and the early 20th century. Because most of the material dates back to the 19th century, Wright had to wrestle with the same challenges that I still face in my work. The ephemerality of material archives of black music and performance. However, as I have learned from Wright and Southern's methods within this volume, one must listen for music, sound, and performance of black expression within a variety of materials, a practice that later became a primary method of black feminist studies, particularly those on enslaved people. In the preface to the work, the authors note that in addition to printed and literary materials, quote, we arrived at the final lists of scanning thousands of widely varied sources, travel books, local histories, personal writings, fiction, non-fiction, slave narratives, court and civil records, and similar publications, end quote. Each of the five areas are divided into some combination of the following categories, literature, artworks, collections of tales and songs. The sources are further divided where applicable into social activities, the religious experience, and songs. This short paper will not allow me to explore the actual content of this work, but I encourage you, if you haven't recently, to revisit this work and consider its historical significance. Revisiting this work reminds me that despite our claims of difficulty in tracing the history of music and black music performance before the recorded era, there is a wealth of material already highlighted from which to explore <coughs> the history of black music. But before I close this tribute, Professor Wright, I would like to point to the innovation already present in this deeply researched bibliographic resource. I'll do so by quoting the authors again from the preface. Quote, perhaps the most novel feature of the bibliography is, its, is in its inclusion of icon, iconographic materials. Our research activities include combing through art books and periodicals, museum catalogues, the illustrated periodical press and books of all types in search of pictures that depict aspects of black American 
both culture, end quote. This method of looking towards images for evidence of the improvisational ephemeral acts of black youth making contemporaneous images precedes Tina Camp's theory of listening to images 2017 by almost two decades. It also shares a relationship with Christopher J. Smith's 2013 work, The Creolization of American Culture, in which the author uses the paintings of William Sidney Mount to reimagine black performance. It also informs my own method in Black Sound of using lithographic images and sheet music covers in an, in an analysis of blackface and black performance. Wright and Southern developed upon this approach in their 2000 publication, Iconography, Images of Music in African American Culture 2000, another vital source of black music and culture. I have only scratched the surface of the minutes, hours, days, years, and decades of work that Professor Josephine Wright has gifted to us through her indefatigable work ethic that has been a critical part of the architecture of black music studies, musicology, and music history in general. I wanted to highlight this thankless work within Professor Wright's room. If I had time, I'd include a snippet on Professor Wright's study of Ignatius Sancho, 1729 to 17. African composer in England from the Black Perspectives in Music 1979, just to demonstrate her scholarly dexterity, as this particular work is an example of how the deep bibliographic and archival work informed her critical method of writing about mostly then and sometimes still unknown Black composers. A practice that we are finally coming around to in mainstream musicology, and one that I hope will continue to be informed by the legacy, presence, and impact of Professor Joseph. Thank you for all that you have been and continue to be to me and to many of us. Matthew Morris. There's a whole lot back there that I just thought I wouldn't um, <laughs> trip on. What a pleasure it is, and I'm going to wrap things up quickly because I know time is um, moving forward. It is fitting to have this panel honoring Josephine Wright in Detroit at this August 50th anniversary year of Sam, because this is the city of her birthplace. And we know her biography, I do not need to go over that part, but I wanna say, as someone who has spent a great deal of time in the Midwest myself, 27 years teaching at the University of Michigan, I can appreciate the specificity of being in the Midwest today. And this commemoration in Detroit feels right. During the antebellum period, Detroit, north of the Mason-Dixon line, was considered a more hospitable place for black folks than the plantation south. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Detroit and Southeast Michigan were important stops on the Underground Railroad. In the 20th century, Detroit was a destination in the Great Migration to escape the Jim Crow South up through the Civil Rights period. Yet, as Taya Miles has shown recently in her 21st century, uh, in the 21st century, in her 2017 book, The Dawn of Detroit, to Chronicle of Slavery and Freedom in the City of the Streets, Detroit is not so easily categorized. I quote from a review on Taya Miles' website that states Detroit was a place where slavery among, quote, Native American, Africans, and indentured servants was at the heart of this Midwest iconic city, end quote. It is this unexpected combination that I want to mention now. How can the known and proudly accepted history of a prominent city connected with the North, the Underground Railroad, and the Great Migration be entwined with previously unknown and quite distressing information, such as the extension of slavery so far North, heading into Canada? How can success be wrapped around such continuing injustice? This is the larger point I want to make about Dr. Josephine Wright. She is our esteemed colleague, pioneer, and champion. Yet I dare also mention that too much of her legacy has been behind the scenes. This panel begins the work to correct the situation. To refer to a term I've used in other research, there is an element of Professor Wright's work that has been part of a shadow culture to the mainstream of musicology for too long. 
cutting across the old-fashioned boundaries of historical musicology and ethnomusicology, her research has recovered many missing pieces for understanding the role of black people in the musical history of the United States, as well as abroad. She has worked in domestic and international archives to construct previously hidden narratives that she began publishing in the 1980s, over 40 years ago. Included in this pantheon are writings about George Paul Green Bridge Tower, the original dedicatee of Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata, Opus 47, and Jose White, a black violinist active in Paris from 1855 to 1875. She has densely packed historical discussions of Ignatius Sancho and the current Hollywood star, but until virtually unknown, Joseph Boulogne Chevalier de saint Georges. She's written about all of them, and this is just a short overview as we have begun to see. At a time when the concept of intersectionality was just being coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in the early 1990s, Dr. Wright brought together the importance of how race and gender are critical themes in music scholarship. In 1992, she published Black Women in Classical Music in Boston during the late 19th century, Profiles of Leadership. And she co-edited, this was in the um, collection of New Perspectives on Music, Essays in Honor of Eileen Suller. She co-edited that with Sam Floyd. And in this essay, she recovered 81 black women who were active in classical music, making in Boston from 1870 to 1900, that first generation after the Civil War. Professor Wright has also been active in historiographic work with the premise that our narratives of music are incomplete as they are. She has written textbook entries such as Early African Musicians in Britain um, in the collection Under the Imperial Carpet, Essays in Black uh, history, 1780 to 1950, which was published with the British press in 1986 as the UK was in early stages of addressing its colonial history in the 1980s. Additionally, she has the art slash classical music chapter in African American Music, an introduction edited by Melanie Burnham and Paul Portia Maltzby, um, second edition Routledge, 2015. She has published bibliographies, such as a preliminary bibliograph bibliographic guide to periodic literature for black music research, and more and more. As you know, just from what we've heard, this is just touching tip, the tip of the iceberg. Perhaps one of the most subtle field-defining activities Professor Wright has been her work as a visionary editor and generous co-editor. As many of you know, and some of you in this room have worked with her in this capacity, Dr. Wright was a contributing editor to Black Perspectives in Music from 1979 to 1990. She was the general editor of American Music, 94 to 97, when, for those of you who don't remember, that was the society journal for the Sonic Society, now us, known as the Society for American Music, and before what we know as JSAM, the Journal for the Society of American Music. Additionally, from 1990 to 2001, she was the series editor for Garland's Music in African American Culture. And for recently minted scholars, Garland is now better known under its parent company, Taylor and Francis. Dr. Josephine Wright is a pioneer whose story has a lot of personal relevance for me. We both spent formative years in the same places. I was born in New York, right outside of the city, and did my undergraduate work in the city, uptown at Barnard, part of Columbia. She was based downtown at NYU for her doctorate, uh, doctoral work. She spent some of her early career at Harvard, where later in the 1980s, I entered for graduate school. She was born in Detroit, and I spent nearly three decades here in my mid-20s to just a few years ago. For 20 of my 27 years at the University of Michigan, I was situated outside of music departments in women's and gender studies, the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, and the Residential College. Having a solid musicology background, I had a model in Josephine Wright that being embedded in the larger world of the humanities within the academy is a critical space for surviving as a black female academic. Dr. Josephine Wright, 
Professor Emerita in Africana Studies and Music at the College of Worcester, we salute your groundbreaking research, and I personally treasure your presence in the field of music scholarship. Thank you so much. I, I only started to get to know you through the Emerge group, um, and it's just been an honor and a delight. Um, and I'm, I, as I was sitting here, the only thing I've contributed to this session is I made the dinner reservation. <laughs> but as I was sitting there, I was thinking what I should have offered to do was make a bibliography for everyone here. So um, I, I will work on that. Um, I would, that would be a project I would love to do so that we could all get caught up. On, on your legacy. Thank you for everything you've done.
lent my voice to the praise for Josephine Wright um, by the comments that have come before. I may have uh, a slightly different perspective uh, because I've had the privilege of working with Josephine with some of the students that I was working with because we brought them in to work with our students who were actually teachers of students. And to have seen the ways in which she was able to present the history, but to inspire the teachers to become carriers of those messages and convey them in turn to their own students was truly inspiring for me in my career. And so, Josephine, I just want to tell you that you may not have had graduate students at the College of Worcester, However, we are all your students. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Guthrie Ramsey. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, uh, Josephine Wright. I remember meeting you in the late 80s uh, at uh, the SAM conference with Dean Root and uh, Judith Tick and Sam Floyd. Um, I too was a research assistant for Eileen Seller, so I understand what that means, how exacting she was. I wanted to say uh, when you wrote to me and said that you were writing an article, uh, an entry about me uh, in the Merrick Group, I thought, oh my God, she's the greatest researcher. What is she going to find? <laughs> say thank you for everything that you've done, being such a warm example for me when I entered this field a long time ago. You were one of the people that I looked up to. You were so nice to me. You took time to talk to me, and I thoroughly appreciate all the work that I still depend on to do my work that you wrote. Thank you. Okay, so the truth has to come out, <laughs> and I have the author uh, uh, authorization for Joseph, Joseph uh, just to say this. So, you all know I'm music theorist, right? Yeah. So I'm kind of here as you know, um, as outsider. So the first conference paper I gave was on the racial invisibility of Chinese America, and it was a you know a very brave thing to to do, and I had no idea what's going to happen. So. There I was in the same conference as a music theorist. There were probably only two in that conference at that time. And I was giving this paper about racial invisibility of Chinese America um, with an issue related to a Chinese opera singer. So I rehearsed that paper with my colleague and then uh, they, they thought it was okay for me to deliver that. This was what, it's 1996 or 97, so it's a really long time ago. So I gave that paper, and I had no idea, but there was this woman sitting in the very back by the door, who was smiling at me the whole time. <laughs> and that was Josephine. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll pay attention to that face, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and no one was like, uh, if other people are frowning, it was okay. Okay, I, I'm just gonna look at that. So what I didn't realize was um, that what happened next was that the paper was finished and I was okay. No one was shouting for uh, uh, you know anything. And then, then there was one woman who said, "Well, you know, I have Chinese late neighbors and I love them." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, so that that's kind of things that were said. So I thought, okay, that, that, that is benign enough. I, I, I didn't have to deal with it. So I was packing my bag. And there I was, Richard Crawford, rushing to the table. And he said, I only knew him a little bit because I'm also uh, like Guy Ramsey in Michigan. And so Guy, um, yeah, no. So Richard come to the table and say, that was wonderful. It pulled a rock underneath. And there I was, giving, with a 
lot of trepidation giving this paper and get this approval. I just, you can only imagine what it feel like, right, as a newbie. So I was like on the cloud for the rest of the conference. Because whenever, you know, Richard saw me, he would say, oh, you know, that paper. That was really, really good. So only years later, I realized it was Josephine who prompted Richard to come to talk to me. <laughs> she said to Richard that there's that Asian woman, you need to mentor her. So after, I mean, it didn't take away what the praise he gave for me, because I still just own that, right? I just <laughs> a lot of other praise I can get. But it just go to sh goes to show how much Josephine have been doing for the people that she sees that needs this extra support. So thank you, Josephine. Thank <laughs> you. 